Uh, during COVID, my husband and I on the internet bought a new home. And we now live in Safety Beach, and I've come from 21 years in Miraburra, Central Victoria. So I'm looking forward to worshipping with you. Right. This morning, I just want to share this reading. It's from Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. Now, send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him constantly, continually. So when he explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Oh, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And when I looked in my a copy of the message, he refers to that as being kosher. So Peter is saying, in our understanding, I will not eat anything that's not kosher. And a voice spoke to him again with the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken back up into heaven again. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you speak. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Thank you, Lynn. I tell you what, one of the things I love week by week is the Bible readings we have. And we have, we're really blessed here to have some fabulous readings. And I don't mean like Shakespearean or dramatic, but really thoughtful, thoughtful folks who just enter in and, and read and then bring something that should be heard. You know, the, the Word of God is so powerful and it speaks to us in so many different ways. Even when I hear it, I pick up different things every time. And depending on the voice, sometimes I notice something in a particular voice I don't hear in another. So thank you, Lynn. May that be the, the first of many opportunities to hear you read and do other things as well. Welcome to you. 
Uh, we appreciate how difficult it is to change from one area to another after a long period of time. Who's the doctors? Where are the specialists? Why don't people use indicators on the road? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things that go on on the peninsula that it's like peninsula only. But welcome to you. We we do look forward to meeting you a lot more over the time. Uh, there's a lot of things rushing through my head. In fact, I spoke to Cliff this morning because Cliff's going to do uh, communion a little bit later on, uh, and Cliff's prepared. But then, what do we say? It's a bit like being on a on a. Um, uh, swinging out on a, on a trapeze without a safety net sometimes. You've done the training, you know what you're meant to do, but then it's like, yeah, but you want to have a little bit of risky freedom as well, don't you? And I, I feel a bit that way with this. I wanted to um, just recapture a couple of things from this particular series, because there's some new folks around today too. Uh, so we've been working through a, a range of different scripture readings from the Old Testament and the New Testament, taking the idea of the table as the centrepiece, um, all the tables of the kingdom, all the different places where God speaks, where Jesus turns up, uh, whether it's on a mountainside and a more alfresco dining, whether it's in a formal home, uh, whether it's entertaining angels unaware, there's lots of different places we've looked at so far. And today is a different kind of table with that, that tablecloth being lowered on the three occasions. But before I talk a little bit about that, uh, I wanted to just backtrack a bit from, from last week. I, I so enjoyed what Gemma brought. That was very powerful reflection. I've watched that video a few times now with the person with cerebral palsy. It's such a, a powerful poem and such a... Imagine standing in those shoes. I'm really grateful for what Gemma brought last week. Uh, but I went off thinking about a couple of other comments. I um, had a brief talk uh, with Paul about Mephibosheth uh, with that reading last week. I know, I know that name. And even getting up here, it's like a wave of cold terror. I'm just going to say it wrong. And uh, and I'm sure one day there'll be like a, a pure Hebrew speaker here will say, come on, get out of the way. Uh, but Mephibosheth, who some of you may not have even heard of before, it's such a powerful account out of Samuel. And um, when he's little, um, some people think between about two and five, he's a son of Jonathan, who is a son of King Saul. And David's troops are rolled, starting to roll through and there's mayhem and the nurse picks up uh, little, the little boy Mephibosheth. Maybe they call him, what is his, what would his abbreviated name be? Miffy, Mibby, I don't know. But anyway, picks him up to rush out and in her haste he gets dropped and his uh, legs are ruined. And so he's a, he's a cripple from now on. He, uh, in my mind I've seen shuffling around and in that culture at that time to have a disability like that uh, what did Gemma say last week? If there's no family support, um, two years estimated you might survive on the street begging before the weight of poverty uh, just overwhelms you with, with disease and disorder and malnutrition and the rest of it. And being exposed to weather, I imagine, too. Um, so, and apart from that, the spirituality of it, to have a disability, to have anything that's a blemish, just like, oh, well... It's not really good. What's that word you use? It's not really kosher. You, you can't be a priest. And if you were a priest who suddenly lost their eyes or their hearing or had a major, even psoriasis, that's it. You, you can't serve in that temple anymore because it's all around the perfection. So here's this little boy with these crippled legs, um, the, the son of Jonathan. He should have been in the line for kingship and now he's broken. And, uh, and Gemma just unfolded that account with him last week. But all I wanted to mention was from a conversation with you, Paul, around the time of Esther, you wind forward. And uh, so you look at the lineage of Mephibosheth and he had one son and then from that son there's other generations to come. And then finally in the future, in um, the time of the Persian Empire, and uh, there's this crazy guy, Haman, who's wanting to wipe out the Jews in the area. He's got a cunning plan to be the, the, you know, the preem special person in the kingdom under, under Xerxes. But there's a Hebrew guy called Mordecai. And Mordecai is a man of profound faith and profound prayer. And his niece is Esther, Book of Esther, who's found her way into the harem inside the, the king's palace at his table. And that king's table becomes very important. That's the place where he makes some really unwise decisions under the influence of drink. He says a whole bunch of really crazy and stupid things. And he um, also listens to Haman too much. Haman sees the king's table as being something very, very precious to him because he can go home and then boast to all of his friends about, I, I ate there. 
And this is what we talked about. And this, this is how, and they give him plans about how he can be honoured. So there's this whole scheme going on and there's this exposed Hebrew woman, Esther. And Mordecai sends a message. We are in so much trouble, we're going to be annihilated. And he calls for prayer. And Esther is the only one in the end knowing that her life will be in the balance. That king has the power of life and death. If he doesn't like her, well, maybe the worst is she's just in the harem as the lower caste wife, never to see him again, or she's wiped out. So the whole of the Hebrew people are fasting and praying over a period of time. And that's Mordecai. God bless him. You wouldn't have a Mordecai without Mephibosheth. And you wouldn't have a Mephibosheth without the, um, the, the, the godly nature of King David, who says, is there anyone in Saul and Jonathan's family that, that needs to be blessed? And someone says, actually, uh, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. And I still sort of picture Mephibosheth shuffling in, in view of, the, of King David, and King David saying, um, we're gonna get people to farm land for you. You'll never be without crops, you'll have income, you'll be provided for, and you're sitting at my table. You're a child of mine. It's such a, a, such a wonderful kingdom picture of the broken who is lifted, and then that broken who is lifted then becomes part of the generation where there's provision and promise and purpose. When Mordecai says, oh, goodness, we're in trouble, what do we do? We're gonna hit, hit the ground on our knees, and worship God and fast and pray for this period of time. And that's all we can do, trust in the sovereign nature of the Lord who saves. So when you join this huge history together, isn't, isn't that amazing? And the other part of that story too is um, the bad guy in the story. Yeah, Haman, yeah. Haman, he was the, uh, uh, the ancestor of Agag, who Saul had been told to wipe out the, the people completely, and he, he didn't. He didn't. Do as he was commanded by the Lord. So you get, yeah, you get the, yeah, so again, you get these thing. ancient, ancient stories of animosity yeah. and generational hatreds that roll through. That's why um, in contemporary counselling, it's really important to think about not just the the life of the individual or the dysfunctional family, for want of a better word. Sometimes you can see actually there's a pattern that rolls forward, but a pattern that can be dealt with, a pattern that can be prayed through, a pattern that can be fasted through, a pattern where brothers and sisters can join together to say, well, how do, how do we bring a new day into this? And that's why when I get into a place like this, you know, go crazy and guessing the young people around you. Because you don't know where the generations wind themselves to until there's somebody else who you wrote a letter to, gave a scripture to, brought them along to church on a random Sunday morning where they find themselves standing in the place where they need to be, being the person that they've been called to be to bring about a massive change. Amen? And that's why I love church. You don't know what happens around the table. So for today's reading, and it's a filming one, I realise it's probably one of my favourites. Um, I think I use it a lot because it's, it, it's a pivot point reading. Uh, in scripture, the pivot point readings you can usually tell because they're given lots of time and lots of space. And in the book of Acts, this opens up and you meet Cornelius' family actually twice when Cornelius has this dream, I need you to go send you people to Joppa and look for this guy who's gonna be up on the roof in the Tanner's house. That's pretty extraordinary for a start. And then Peter's having a simultaneous experience of the threefold, threefold dropping of the cloth no, what's God saying? Pay attention. Mm -hmm. uh, you think of other three folds in scripture. Yeah. Peter on the beach. John 21. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. <coughs> Do you love me? Now, it's another, the three folds are really, really important around gaining attention. Don't, don't miss one thing. So Peter's attention is really being, really being taken. So to get, I, I think, the model of this... Uh, you can close your eyes if you like. Some people don't like doing it. But I just want to describe a little scene to you and then uh, we'll go on from there for a short time before Cliff comes to lead us. So if you'd like to close your eyes, do so. What I'll have you to do is picture that it is, it is maybe a bit of a day like yesterday. Beautiful sun. Not a breath of wind in the air and everything seems beautifully still. And you're... Not at a scary height, but up up in the sky in an air-filled balloon. 
and everything is quiet except for you can hear birds and you can feel the sun and it is just beautiful and then underneath you, you look over the side and there's just a glorious lake that's ringed on one side by pastures and by low mountains on the other a little bit of snow in the distance and the lake is without a ripple completely flat like glass and so much so you can even see the reflection of the balloon that you're traveling in it's a turquoise blue like a beautiful new zealand lake and you find in your hand that you have just a um a rock it's not overly heavy but it's you can lift it easily without struggling and you decide to just put it over the side and drop it and you watch it fall rapidly and hit the water And then you see the ripples start. The ripples really close to where the rock entered and they begin to just move their way out in increasing waves, increasing waves, and increasing waves, and increasing waves, increasing waves, until you start to notice they're actually lapping at the very edges of that lake. It seems impossible that they would go so far, but the lake is so still that the ripples aren't stopped by anything. And so they move from the center to the edge. And open your eyes. I love that. I love that image because it's an image of the of acts. It's what happens as from the epicenter, the place where the 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 weight hits life, where it hits the water, the ministry of Jesus, the arrest, cruel crucifixion, resurrection, glorification, all of these held, things held so tight. And then from there, as Jesus says to the disciples, go from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. The ends of the earth where every nationality, every tongue is spoken, every generation is found. And those ripples are still moving on in the world around us. They're still going out to the ends of this world, to the ends of this age, and I don't know whether you realise or not, but everyone in this room today, from the youngest to the oldest, you're, you are a ripple. You are a ripple. And what a beautiful thing that is, travelling along through that lake. You, and most of the time we're not even aware that we're a ripple, because you can't see from high enough to see where you are. You can't see where you started and where you're heading to. You don't know quite where the destination is. But when you see the truth of it, you realise you're a ripple. And all of that book of Acts is the Holy Spirit being the rock that's dropped and moving out. And it doesn't need a big church or a cathedral. It just works through human hearts and through human eyes and ears and observations as people hear and drink in something of the truth of the living God and they get it and then they go and the ripple moves. So in the reading today, we get ripples. Peter, who's already on a journey, a good Jewish boy who only has kosher food and it's more than just the food he really only knows a kosher world how to be pure and how to be clean and not do the things that make you look like one of the and they'd call them a, a gentile dog how to not be one of those dogs with those kind of practices and even then when some of those practices don't sound that bad to me because we've made a long journey as our ripple has gone on one of the things that in kosher cooking you can't do you can't have meat mixed in with any dairy so it's goodbye cabronara it's good oh, and it's got pork oh. failure on two two counts and think of all the other meals you might be tempted to add a bit of cream in with whatever you're doing and no you can't so that's the world that peter's aware of but the weight of Jesus, the life of Jesus, are now rippling through his life, and he's becoming a ripple too. We already see it in this reading because he's on the tanner's roof. He's got a friend who's a tanner. A tanner who deals with dead animals, and that's where they're getting the leather from for their shoes and their belts and everything else. It's a, it's a vital industry, but it's an unclean industry. It's spiritually unclean. And yet Peter's there. He's got this mate. He's a tanner. He's... The ripples already taken in this far and now the tablecloth has dropped down and it's not even so much about the food it's god saying no don't call anything unclean that i call clean so i don't want to hear any of this who's in and who's out kind of nonsense and and you're the best and others are terrible um i'm the one 
who gets to call what's unclean and clean. So pay attention. And then there's a knock on the door and the visitors from Cornelius arrive. And you think it wouldn't have been that long ago that one Peter wouldn't have been on a tanner's roof and he wouldn't want to have been talking to these people except for the influence of Jesus and now the influence of this vision and the influence of the Holy Spirit beginning to empower and move the ripple of his life into something quite different. And then I think about Cornelius and his table, his crew. This is a man with authority, he's got a household, wife, kids, servants, slaves, all these things happening for him, and yet he can't wait for Peter to arrive. Why? Because he's given attention to God, and God has made him a ripple, and he's attentive. And rather than having this vision and thinking, oh, I must have had too much wine last night, he realises, no, this is important, I'm going to send my slaves, my servants, off they go, find this man and bring him here. And I think about Peter as his ripple now comes to the shores of Cornelius' world. And what does he see? Well, he enters a home with a table with all kinds of different foods, I imagine. And Peter sees the man. And he sees the family. And when Cornelius says, well, there's any reason not to get baptised. No, it, it, this, is, this is the place for baptism because the Lord is active. There's new things here. And we're not really told much about what Cornelius did. I can't even think of anything. There might be other bits and pieces in, in um, sort of Christian history somewhere, but he, he's now a solid ripple who's moving out through his role within the Roman Empire. And think about the influence and the conversations that he brings into his places of authority and power as he recognises a higher authority and a higher power in his life. So I think that's why um, this uh, account has given so much space in Acts. There's things to notice. Be attentive to dreams and visions. Recognise that the Lord is at work in the world in a variety of different ways. And what a thrill it is to just actually go and do what you've been given to do. Whether that might be the impression you might have to think, well, maybe I better write to my grandchildren. Maybe it's about time before I flip off the mortal coil to just write down um, you know, a couple of key things about why I live the way I live and how much the Lord has, has meant to me and make it your epistle to them. Whether they read it or not, get it out there. Uh, whatever it is, um, let your ripple move to the furthest capacity it possibly can. Because whether you're a ripple who's nine or ten, or whether you're a ripple who's 92 or 93, uh, the ripple doesn't get to the edge until you're at the edge. And then, well, that edge is an illusion anyway, isn't it? A new day, a new kingdom, and all the ripples join into something magnificent and freeing and wonderful. Let's just pause and pray, and then Cliff, if you'd like to come and lead communion, that would be fa really fantastic. Lord God, I want to thank you that whether we're aware of it or not, we are, we are your ripples in the world. Yeah, we're a, bit, we're a little skittish, sometimes a little crazy, sometimes we're lazy, sometimes we're confused, but we are your people. So we pray, Lord, for all the ripples of your people around the world because we all need empowering and we all need clarifying and we all need wisdom and we all need strengthening and we all need to know uh, what your vision for us is and how we can live as a ripple of purpose and of godly power and of justice and of mercy. Lord, your stone has fallen into the lake of our lives. Move us out, Lord, to the ends of the earth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> you know, when you contacted me yesterday, and I'll do it then, <laughs> when you contacted me yesterday and said, would you like to speak? In all innocence, I said yes. And then I suddenly found out it was not next Sunday, <laughs> but this Sunday. And so, like so many people, I said, oh, heck, what am I going to talk about? It was then that the thought went through my mind. You've been contemplating, I would call it that, uh, Worrying, talking, talking about in your mind about a subject, why not take that into the church tomorrow and share it with other people? 
I don't know if you, like me, at times have something that reoccurs time and time again during the day. It might be you wake up with a song, you know, morning has broken, and then you've got the tune in your mind all day. It keeps coming back. And it might not only last for one day, but several. This is the sort of thing that I've run into. And mine is possibly a more serious one in some respects. Here we are at Lent, Easter just around the corner, and this subject. I can hear the words, Eli, Eli, Lima Sabakini. Those words have been ringing in my mind for weeks now, perhaps months, and I'm debating them. Debating where God sits in this picture. We know where Jesus sits. He started at his early life, led up to this point. This was the climax. But where, where was God in my mind? That's the problem that comes with me. Theologians will tell you that God's wrath against the world was so great that when Jesus took it all upon his shoulders, God couldn't look at him. I wonder, as many of you know, I have a one word understanding of God, love. Now I ask you, any of you who are fathers or mothers come into that as well, could you stand or sit however you are and look at your son at the time that he's going to be a sacrifice? Could you bear to watch it? No, you turn your head away. You turn your head away. And for me, that is the God that I understand. Not that he threw God, threw Jesus to the winds, but rather his love was so great for the world and for Jesus that he could not look but had to turn away. But let's come back then to Jesus himself. Jesus upon the cross. Jesus who died for you and me. And at that last supper, the night before, <coughs> he took bread and he broke it. And he took wine and blessed it. And with these elements, gave us a sacrament that we could carry through the years down until now. I'm going to invite you to come up and take one of the little packages that we've got here. Please be careful, the lids don't fit. They're already sitting on the top. But please uh, come up and take one and I will just give a preliminary prayer before we do that. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee now and think of these sacraments, the sacrament of the bread and the wine, we ask, O oh Lord, that your blessing be with us, that we may have a greater understanding of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us that we come before you with our prayers. Grant, O Lord, then, that as we partake, your spirit enters us, and we go from this place refreshed and encouraged. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come on.